You are all in for such a treat this evening as we virtually welcome back Catherine Weber to discuss her latest work of fiction, Jane of Hearts and Other Stories. Catherine is the author of a memoir and six highly praised and award-winning novels that have made her a book club favorite. Her last novel, Still Life with Monkey, was a finalist for the Connecticut Book Award for Fiction, the Connecticut Center for the Book Spirit Award, and the New England Society in the City of New York Book Award. She lives in Connecticut and tonight joins us virtually from England. Also joining us this evening, we're thrilled to welcome Caroline Levitt. Caroline is the award-winning author of 12 novels, including the New York Times bestsellers, Pictures of You and Is This Tomorrow? Her essays and stories have been included in New York Magazine, Psychology Today, More, Parenting, Red Book, and Salon. She's a book critic for People, The Boston Globe, and The San Francisco Chronicle, and she teaches writing online at Stanford and UCLA. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming to our virtual stage, Caroline and Catherine. Take it away, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, I first want to say that I'm especially delighted to be doing this because Catherine and I are friends. We met many years ago at an online book venue called Readerville. And we quickly became friends and no one knows more about writing than Catherine and no one's more fun to have lunch with than Catherine. So I'm thrilled and I just wanna show this beautiful cover again. Before I start the questions, I wanna read some of the praise. A scintillating collection of short stories and a novella that encompass pathos and hilarity, like diamonds, works that are iridescent with tangible and psychological detail. That's from Book Booklist. That's an amazing review. In elegant prose, Weber offers intimate views on her characters in her lives. PW. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing book. So Catherine, you're known as a critically acclaimed award-winning novelist, and you've also, of course, written memoir. You've been named by Granta as one of the 50 best young American writers. What was it like for you to venture into the world of writing short stories with this book? Do you get the sense that for you, are short stories more like a heady affair and a novel's like a marriage? What's the difference for you? <laughs> well, first of all, it's great to be here. It's great to be here with you, Caroline. I just finished reading With or Without You. Oh, thank um, you. And it's, it's really a marvelous book. And I, I, this is completely off the track here, but I want to say one of the things I always admire about your fiction is the name your characters just the right names. And sometimes oh. <laughs> that makes such a difference. Uh, don't, yeah. Haven't you ever read fiction where you just feel there's something artificial, there's something wrong? About name, right, yeah. right. Yeah, and you, your characters wear their names just right. I mean, there, there's, you just, you really, you know, I suppose it's not an accident given that you had a, a career at one point, at least if not currently, naming products. I mean, you were naming Yes, products. that's right, I was a professional <laughs> namer. <laughs> Right. So, as a professional so name, anyway, back. I notice as a reader that your characters just really are so perfectly named, and I wanted to you. say that. Thank you so much. So, tell us about writing short a collection of short stories. What was it? So, why so, now? So, what was it these, like? Well, why now? These stories, uh, many of them, appeared in earlier forms, going back um, more than twenty years. So. And, and, but that isn't to say that this book is just, you know, greatest hits. It isn't, because almost every story, um, whether it appeared first in Story or Red Book or Southwest Review or The New Yorker, um, I have really revised, expanded, um, developed further in certain ways. Uh, and there is a difference when you write stories. There's a difference when you write a novella between, um, you know, it, it isn't just word count. The difference is, is striking, I think. I think there are many differences between a story and a novella and a novella and a novel. But it turns out that as I strung these together um, and, and made something with connective tissue, really, that links, it, you know, certainly not a, a book in stories the way uh, Olive, the marvelous Olive Kitteridge is a novel in stories. That's not what this is. But it turns out I have been writing about the same things all this time. 
um, going That's back to my first publications. And my first fiction in print is in this book. Um, it's Friend of the Family. And it appeared in The New Yorker, uh, taken off the slush pile. And it was the very first fiction I ever published anywhere. Um, and that was in um, 1993. So uh, it, it turns out that whether it's or the situations, I, I'm not saying that there's repetition. I don't think it's repetitive, but I think, I think it rhymes. I think it echoes. And those rhymes and echoes, which we all have in our lives mm -hmm. and patterns of living, um, are really one of the one of the features of, of the way I um, put this together. So I've been writing short stories all this time, and I've been writing novels all this time. Um, some things really just lend themselves to um, one short, tight narrative arc that takes you from here to there, usually, not always, but usually in the time that is elapsed almost in real time from the first page to the last page. I'm not saying there aren't stories that take place over longer periods, but it's a very different kind of writing. No side stories, no backstories, except they're all there. They're all implicit. They, right. you, you believe those lives flow in all directions off the page. That's the trick of it. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about the how and the why of your genius for finding the small details that drive so many of these wonderful stories. There's the fertilizer that looks like pink princess glitter. And all these details add to these startling discoveries for the character. You seems, you take what seems at face value, an ordinary, very alive scene, such as a girl Harriet babysitting a baby, and then suddenly everything changes. It's as if you draw away a curtain and it be the story becomes something else. Um, Harriet, that girl, realizes what she's really doing and it's depending on how you think about it, it's either profoundly sad or sad and full of a kind of hope. And I loved that. And either way, those details just resonate with, we just can't forget them. And I'm reminded of this, and there was this Entertainment Weekly rave for your novel, Triangle, which said, this must be, this might be the most effective 9-11 novel yet. And it isn't even about 9-11. And I, I like feel that. like, <laughs> yeah, wasn't that great? And it's like that with these stories. I mean, we think we're reading a story about a, you know, a babysitter. And it's really about something much more profound and much deeper. And I, I just want to, I would just I have, to talk about that. I had the experience once of babysitting a baby I never saw. And you're kidding. I, I think the baby was in there and <laughs> sleeping, <laughs> but but the what if of it resonated with me, you know, from the time I was whatever I was, 13 or 14, um, till I wrote that story. Uh, and I had made a note about it, and the note called it the invisible baby, but it was sort of, and then what? And what if? And what about that? Um, so I thought about it for years, and then um, it lent itself to the very, very short form. It's the shortest thing I've ever written, and it's the most anthologized thing I've ever written. It's been made into films. I mean, it's a, it's a tight little, you know, here to there. I was um, going to comment on how short it is. It's like that very famous Hemingway story, um, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. The apocryphal it's, Hemingway story, the six word story. Yes. Yeah, the six word story. And it, it yeah. was the same thing. That story was so short and yet it was a lifetime. You know, you just don't stop thinking about that girl and how she's going to deal with her life from then on or how the parents deal with it. Or what she perceives, what she, what she perceives about the world. Yes. Right, exactly. Um, I also wanted to comment on in talking about the underpinnings of everything. I'm always delighted that although your work is absolutely profound and serious, it's also very, very funny. There are moments that really tickle, but they're written as if it's just, you know, saying a statement, like the walls are blue. The I, I want to read the first sentence of Mr. Antler's Princess Dust because it made me laugh out loud when I saw it. It was sort of like, oh, I have to read this story. It's so delightful. It was the summer they tried going door to door selling poisonous mushrooms. That little 
detail immediately makes us laugh and want to know what what's going on here we have to keep going so i want to know how conscious are you of those hilarious brilliant little lines i think i'm pretty conscious um it, it also sets the table for the book in the sense that there are some echoes of usually a pair of young people um, are doing something really dangerous and risky and they're not really aware of it, but they're right. like walking along the edge. So it begins with poison mushrooms and I'm, I adore the cover of this book. I pestered and pestered the art director. Um, the back cover has the poison mushrooms at yeah, the bottom. They're here. And they're those are three, three varieties of poison mushrooms that could be found <laughs> in, the, in my fictional Connecticut town of Northbury where almost everything takes place in the book. Um, but there's also late, about in the middle of the book, um, a pair of teenagers who managed to climb up um, to the top of the, a World Trade Center tower when it was under construction. So again, in, in incredible risk and danger, but somehow it makes sense to them. Uh, and then the title novella is about a pair right. of children wandering around their neighborhood at at a loss for things to do at the end of the summer and they begin breaking into houses in the neighborhood <laughs> and then they discover a, if not abandoned a fairly well forgotten um, bomb shelter where there's an entrance in somebody's shed and they make that their headquarters so there is this sort of cloud of potential danger while oblivious children are just you know doing what children do and that I, so there so there is something that that connects all the way through from the first right. page to the last. Right. There's a, there's a line in the novella, Jane of Hearts, that I just love. And I actually wrote it out to put it by my computer. It says, all of this happened and none of it's true. Or maybe none of this happened and it's all true. To me, that's really a profound assessment of what it is to be a writer. And I would love you to talk about that. Well, you know, it's what it is to be a writer. You know, I, I love the unreliable narrator, but I would then observe that we're all unreliable. Yes. Narrators. So life is one long unreliable narrative. Uh, so uh, owning it um, and, and, and really sort of playing with it is, is something that I think um, also threads through most of my work. So I'm very interested in the narrative voice or or if it's a close third person what kids these days call free and direct discourse and i just call close third person um, <laughs> where that that character is trying to sell you something has has a has a determination to see things a certain way believe things a certain way and i think it's really one of the great joys as a reader of fiction which is the only way i ever began to write fiction is sort of as a reader wanting to write something i'd want to read where what the character knows, what the character is trying to persuade you of or tell the story about starts to diverge from what the reader knows because the reader right. starts to know more or get another way of thinking about it or think, really? No, that doesn't seem plausible. Doesn't this actually mean that, not this? Right. You know, so the reader is, is in a way now developing a counter story. And that that sort of parallax, I, I think, is one of the great pleasures of for me of writing fiction, but also of, of reading fiction. Right, right. I would agree with you. I would like to know a little bit about your writing process, how it's changed, how it's changed, how difficult it's been to write during the pandemic and now the Ukraine invasion. What sustains you? I know that I have a lot of writer friends who say, oh, I can't, I just can't write right now. It's not as important as what's going on. But my feeling is that art equals empathy. And if we can put that out in the world, it's a good thing. So tell us about how you write, how it's well, changed, how you, you know, write. It's always right now. It's always right now. It's never not right now. Right. <laughs> so if not now, when, you know, right, and of course, right. I mean, I, 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 I'm a very haphazard writer. I don't have a process that I, I don't have a disciplined process, I should say. But um, there are times when I'm thinking, 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 and I could be you know, doing laundry or driving the car and have a light bulb moment that and, and, and realize something about what it is I'm writing 
that sort of clicks into place. So I think there's writing, there's writing and writing. I'm always writing and writing, but then there's writing it down. That's right. <laughs> that's where, you know, <laughs> the words are on the page. I can spend years mentally writing something before I know how I want to write it because I, I think I have the, the situation and the characters and this happens and then this happens and then what could happen from there before I know whose story it is, before I know whose story it is, you know, whose point of view is, is central, who, who is this really about, who owns this story? And I think um, sometimes I can come to that quite late. It, you know, I, I know the situation, but I, I'm not yet sure which it's going to be. You know, yeah. haven't, you, haven't you heard that sort of, it's an old chestnut that's somewhat true. Um, there really are only two plots, either. Right. Either somebody goes on a trip or a stranger comes Stranger in. comes into the midst. So that's, yeah. the, that's the question. Are you telling it from the point? It's the same story. It's really one story. It's just, are you the stranger who comes to town? Or, you know, somebody goes on a trip and then comes to town. I mean, you know, so <laughs> the question is, you know, which end you're looking at. That's so interesting that you said that because I sort of feel the same way where I feel like novels and ideas marinate. I might have an idea for a novel and it, it's like wine. It's it's not ready before it's time mm -hmm. to be put on the page, but it's always sort of circling in my mind. Do you ever find that you're writing more than one novel at a time? Yes. And sometimes that's useful because then if you kind of hit a a, a, a sort of a becalmed moment with one, you have the other to turn to. Right. So sometimes in the, in the developing stages, that can be useful. At a certain point, then each becomes the excuse for not writing the other, and that becomes problematic. Um, my last novel, Still Life with Monkey, it was really either that or the one I'm starting now, and I decided on Still Life with Monkey. So the, the novel I'm writing now is something, I have notes that go back to 2011, on um, um, the, the basic sort of essence of, you know, what is this a story about? Um, so it, it, but yeah. I, you, at a certain point, you have to make a choice. I don't know anyone who's ever written two novels at once all the way through. I have to say that there was one point where I had, we met for lunch and I had, we were just talking and I had two novels that I was thinking of writing. I didn't know which one to write. I was, it's like, strictly torn between two lovers and you said okay tell me about one of them and I started to tell you about one and you said you told me about that one first that's the one you're writing <laughs> and I thought oh my god she's she's right <laughs> and you were absolutely you were absolutely right and it sort of gave me permission in a very subtle way to decide oh yeah that is the book that I need to be writing you know right I now. think I think this is this could be a controversial comment. I think women particularly work very hard to be fair, to be fair to yes. their ideas, to be fair to their characters, and not to have favorites, because you're not supposed to have favorites. You're supposed to be fair to everybody. Right. And I think that one of the things that can go wrong in a novel when you've written a draft, and there's pleasant writing sentence to sentence. It's an interesting situation. These are nice characters, but what's, what's not happening? And it's often because it's too balanced because you're giving, say, the two main characters equal time. And that's a mistake. You have to pick one to favor and change the other because that's where you get the off balance that is going to create motion and, and drive it forward. And I think that even being fair to your two ideas is something... Um, to get over. It's not a dinner party. You don't have to speak equally. Right. You know. <laughs> right. That that brings me to the, the odious notion that all characters must be sympathetic and likable. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I knew you'd have something to say about that. <laughs> Please talk about that. <laughs> well, I think it's, um, I think it's a shame if readers, if marketing departments, um, judge novels by how well you can identify with the main character. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problem with the main character, um, the way perhaps we might have a problem with Humbert Humbert um, or, or Alexander Portnoy, then, right. um, you know, then we don't want to publish this book or my book group doesn't want to read this book because these might not be nice people. These might not be people we would want to know or be. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, one of the reasons to write fiction is to encounter people you don't know. Yes. And 
might not want to know and don't want to be. And, you know, why do why do people love to watch, you know, crime and see murders, you know, because that's not what their lives are. That's right. Uh, but I think we live in a moment, we live in a really strange moment that is affecting the production of fiction, I think. Yes. Uh, where I, I feel as if the model of YA fiction has now kind of sort of absorbed the the thinking about mainstream literary literary thing, which is a YA novel is about someone where the reader identifies with that person. And it might be someone who ends up on a kind of quest, a sort of sword of a stone um, that they didn't mean to sign up for, but they sort of got into it. And that's whether that's Hunger Games or, you know, right. Fault in our stars, you know, it might be disease, it might be, you know, the evil overlords, it might be the abusive family, whatever it is, they end up on a quest, they have a best friend who might actually die, unless it's going to be a trilogy. Um, but then at a certain point, they triumph. And the YA reader is along for the ride and, and, and right. loves this form. And I am not critical of the YA novel, but I am critical of the sort of armature of the YA novel being imposed on other kinds of novels. So right. if you don't if, if you don't want to be that character or you don't like that character, then it's not a good book, then then what? You know, I, know. <laughs> I, 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 know. I feel that what we're the world is going to be missing out on a lot of novels about a lot of acerbic people. I mean, who wants to be Olive Kitteridge? She's a pill. Uh, you know, so I mean, <laughs> difficult, difficult characters, characters certainly can get through and do get, you know, into print. But there is this sense, I think, I think I've, I've been frustrated by book groups where they judge a book by whether or not they like the main character. I know, I know. You're not supposed, it's not what it's about. You know, right. <laughs> it's like it's not what if if you went through the world and all you interacted with were people that you really liked, you wouldn't learn, <laughs> you know, you would not grow. You would stay in stasis. Um, there's actually, you know, another thing I wanted to talk about, which is I know that a lot of YA readers in the last five years have been jumping on other YA authors if they didn't like the way they were presenting um groups that were not like the writer. Like if you were a YA person of color and you were writing about, um, I don't know, a white person or something and they didn't like the way it was done, they would clamor about it. And they did this so much that more than a few YA writers lost their contracts. Um, yes. I heard from a, a writer recently who lost a contract for a book because it was ultimately decided it was an elitist book about a well-educated uh, white woman who was- You mean like the House of Mirth? Yeah. Or yeah. The country, or yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, the yeah. ambassadors or- and, and yeah. that, I looked at that and I thought, what is going on? Like, what, certainly we don't want stereotypes in fiction, but if you do your research, then there won't be stereotypes. But yeah. say like, I don't want to read about an elitist woman. Or, or people who have gotten books pulled because they said, well, nobody wants to write about, read about an elitist woman. And we certainly don't want to read about an elitist man. Well, that's a very narrow shoebox there. It is. And I don't know what we can do to open that up well, a book. A bit. Yeah, we, we live in a moment when what I would call representation is now damned as appropriation. Um, and by that measure, um, we should never have had Sophie's Choice because right. a white, a white Southern man, not you know someone who was in a concentration camp um, <laughs> like Sophie, uh, because he appropriated someone else's heritage, someone else's story, and I think we it's a very very um, malnourished kind of literature if you can only write about people if you belong to that group. And uh, I do think that writing about others, with, and others could include, in my case, for instance, a quadriplegic who was the main character. Mm -hmm. of my That's novel. right. Um, if you write about people who are not you and did not have your experiences, which is to say most everybody in all of my yeah. novels are not me and did not have right. my experiences. Right. Um, 
you, but if you're writing about a particular group, a particular time, I mean, I've written a novel about the Triangle Fire where my characters are fiction, but the fire is real and real people had those experiences. They lived that. So I felt that I had a duty to get it right. To get it right. I, right. I, I think that when you're writing about anything, you have a duty to get it right. But when you are writing about other, you really need to get it right. And, you know, it, I don't, I really don't like write what you know. I, I find that totally useless. I do think you should flip it around, though. I think you should know what you write. What you write. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think of, I hate the term sensitivity readers. I do too. certainly, when you read, I think it's the sensitivity. Although certainly I think when you're writing a person unlike you, you should talk to a lot of people who are like the person you're writing. Sure. So you can find the story. But the whole thing about sensitivity, artists meant to be disruptive, don't you think? It's not meant to please all the time. It's also a representation of how people actually are, right. not how people might live to certain ideals. Um, I mean, I, I know someone who has a book that's being edited right now where if, if a man refers to going to prostitutes and the publisher's readers are saying, no, he should call them sex workers. Well, but that's not- But that's not what the guy would do. say. Right. No, no, right. no. So people are not allowed to um, speak freely in fiction um, in, in, or, you know, or you do it at your peril. And it's, we live in a really strange time. It's a, it's a it's really a strange, strange time. time. Uh, if you were an actor, um, you know, you're Italian, you cannot play a Native American, um, you know, and, and so on. And I, I think it's time for a lot of correction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to writing fiction, I mean, to me, um, it's very strange to feel that, that we're all meant to stay in our lanes. Because, right. because that's just not what is the impulse to write fiction. It's right. not my impulse to write fiction, not yours. No, impulse. it's to go right off the divider and out of the lane and to see what else is there and hopefully to do it with sensitivity and with the right facts. But staying, you don't want to end up just writing about yourself because that's... No. That's not no. fun and it's boring. Well, that's, not what I'm, well, that's not what I'm here for on earth. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, so I want to ask, you're a writer known for your inventiveness, but also for the voice. Your characters have these indelible voices, whether it's the guy in the monkey helper, or I'm thinking of the voice in True Confections, which was just so wonderful. Um, there are many different voices in this collection. Let me show the gorgeous cover again I should say that the, the contents of that box really as as you know um literally are in the novella I mean that box full of uh, of artifacts is in the novella but most of those artifacts also occur in other stories along the way um I mean they're again it's the echoes and rhymes of the way little objects in our lives you know sort of objects bear mute witness to our lives I mean and, and, and it's so interesting, don't you find if you go to someone else's house and you see books that you have at home and it's almost like seeing, picking out your child in a class picture or something, oh, there, there he is, there she is. And there's something incredibly familiar about those books on the shelf, but they're, what are they doing in this house? Um, so there's a shared experience, there's a shared relationship, not the same relationship, no doubt, but I, I'm, I'm just really intrigued by the way, um, we have relationships to objects that are just there through our lives and have meaning. You know, you might have a teapot that was your grandmother's, but if it's at a tag sale, it's not going to have that meaning anybody else. Um, right. But it might look like something interesting. You know, some 20 year old might buy it because the colors remind her of, you know, the Northern Lights when she went to Iceland. I mean, you know, it, it could have completely different meaning, but it, but it is, it's the hidden meaning. It's the way we all look at things and, own things and they have resonance for us that no one else can possibly experience. What what objects have resonance for you? Oh, all kinds of objects, um, whether it's books of my childhood that were actually my grandmother's from her childhood. So oh. there's there's her handwriting on the fly leaf. That's incredible. Um, yeah, toys that toys, um, yeah. 
I played with, my children played with, and now my grandchildren play with. Um, so I guess I'm also interested in things that have lasted through time. I mean, I have furniture that belonged to great grandparents, um, but sometimes it's, you know, the shirt my husband wore the day our daughter Lucy was born 40 years ago. He still, oh my. still wears that shirt. That's He's, amazing. I, <laughs> it brings up I all those it, memories, I bet. I, I gave it to him for Father's Day, the year he was about to be a father. And he wore it the day she was born. And um, it's a beautiful blue sort of Tattersall shirt. But of course, it has all kinds of meaning and, and resonance. What about you? You must have oh, objects. Million things. I still have cowboy still have... boots and earrings. I know. <laughs> no, that I have. I have saved clothing. I have a pair of cowboy pants that Max wore when he was one that mm -hmm. I saved, and I will always save. I have um, toys of his. Certainly, I have the menu from uh, the cafe in the village where I first met Chef. It's like all those things because they all tell stories beyond yes. what they are. And I, I mean, I think that's why I was so fascinated with this book because every single item on here has a deeper meaning to a character in the stories. And that's just brilliant. That's just brilliant. I want to backtrack a bit to ask you about Still Life with Monkey, a, a novel that I just loved. Um, it had rave New York Times and Washington Post and starred reviews. You did tremendous research. And I'm just really curious because the book was really about what makes a life worth living and what you think makes a life worth living may not be what somebody else thinks. So I wonder if you could tell us what makes life worth living for you? Interesting. Um, and you know, I, I think one of my, one of the points I hope I got across in that novel was that um, disabled people should have the same freedoms and choices to make decisions about their lives that everybody else has. And um, whether or not you agree with their choice, um, people should have full, full options. Um, so that, which is something I was criticized for heavily, actually. Um, wow. <laughs> so, How do you even answer that other than saying well, people should have the right to, to their own choices, their body? Yeah. Now, Karen Joy Fowler loved the book in the Washington Post, except for when she then said that the book was all but ruined by the choice the character made at the end of the story. And it, but what other choice I, could I, he I have made? The character's right to make the choice, you know? Right. So, and what other choice could he could would he have made, knowing what we all know about him? About, about that choice? character. It's that not character. just a generic person with those issues. It's that character. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this goes so back makes, to but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This goes and back to while, go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Helper, helper monkeys have now been made virtually illegal in so many places. That, what? That really? helping, hands, helping Hands has stopped the program. <gasps> oh, no. So, uh, this is terrible. So, like, but, so but, Mon Monkey College, where monkeys were trained over a period of years and developed all kinds of vocabulary and skills so they could help people um, who were disabled um, and not just provide companionship, but turn on the lights or scratch an itch or fetch a pencil or pick up a dropped phone. Um, they, they've now, it's now really monkey assisted living. I mean, they're going to live out their natural lives. There are still some placements, <gasps> terrible, but there won't be any new placements. And those monkeys will eventually, you know, the placements will eventually come to an end. And That's the program terrible. is coming to an end. So what are these disabled people supposed to do? Just have human well, helpers? Well, That's yes, not the or, same or, as or, an animal you love. Or AI. I think the theory is that there are now with robotics, there are more and more options, but that doesn't that 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 doesn't mean a, a warm-blooded creature who's incredibly loyal to you and bonded right. to you. But PETA, um, we don't really have to talk about monkeys too much more, but PETA managed to um help pass laws that ban monkeys because they are deemed exotic. They are not considered assistance animals. There are only two kinds of animals that are now allowed to fly commercially in the United States. Oh, One is dogs and the other, you would never guess this, this is like the worst wordle where you would try 29 times. Um, 
miniature horses. What? <laughs> and the other, <laughs> the other is just the animal you're allowed to fly. Miniature with. horses? Uh, yes. How? Yes. I, I don't know how many of them are getting on a plane as we speak. But um, <laughs> it, it, so my novel is very much a message in a bottle. It's very much a time. Right. Yeah. And it's time. Time. The present is no longer the present. It's actually not going to be happening any longer. It was already illegal in Connecticut. So one of the ways it was a, it was a work of fiction was that it was happening in New Haven, where um, you would not be allowed to have a helper monkey because in the state of Connecticut, they are deemed exotic animals and are not elect, you know, they're not pets. Wow. And they're not, and they're not helper, they're, they're not deemed assistance animals. So, but I spent a lot of time thinking about capuchin monkeys and I spent some time getting to know a particular capuchin monkey. Um, and um, it was- You like peanut butter, right? Yes. You told me that. I don't remember that. Yes. And she would um, actually sometimes dig it out of the jar with any, you know, a ballpoint pen. I mean, anything, anything <laughs> that came to hand. Um, yeah. An interesting little character of Farah. Oh. So, Let's um, turn to your teaching career. You're, in a, you're a highly acclaimed writing teacher. And I know I've relied on your story genius with my novels. I want to know, do you feel like it's easier to look at somebody else's work and see what's not quite working than it is with your own work and what sure. have sure. And what, <laughs> yeah, okay and what have your students taught you and how do you think they differ from you when you were a writing student in college or, or well, I, well, you I were was never a, a writing student in that's college right. for one that's thing, right you were because I'm strange but I'll tell you how they differ I mean I I'm just done with seven years of teaching at Kenyon College wonderful marvelous students I think that when I was that age, I was ambitious to write, but unlike most of the students I've taught since I was teaching at Yale in 1996, um, and I taught there for eight years, I think this generation knows so much more about what it is they want to write. And they have so much more of a developed sense of their voice as writers and what, what the plan is. And I think that I was just really much vaguer than that when I was, you know, 20. I, I was, there's no, there's no question. Um, so I'm, I'm a late bloomer anyway. I published my first novel the year I turned 40, but a uh, long way around to that. But I think that um, kids these days are very organized and dedicated and they have a plan and I, I admire that. So I don't know, I don't know what that, um, you know, I don't know what the downside of that would be. I am having a, your battery is low message that is uh -oh. very fortunate. Um, so I may need a moment here to find. Okay, I will take this moment to show everybody this gorgeous, gorgeous cover again. Hey, I'm just Jane. gonna do this. If I disappear, I will come back. Okay. I, I mean, if I lose the connection, I will be right back with this. This is Jane of Hearts, Catherine <laughs> Weber. And as she's pointed out, every single thing on this cover can be found inside the book, like the poison mushrooms on the back. And it's truly a wonderful, wonderful, strange and extraordinary book. I also want to talk about how, while we're waiting for Catherine, how much Catherine has really helped me. I have delivered her these 500 page novels, which she has gone through and almost instantly honed in like a, like a crow finding that shiny thing uh, of what needed to be fixed and what didn't. Okay, so welcome back, Catherine. I was seeing your oh, praises. So I want to say, I was thinking about that with one of your books particularly. And I think one of the things that jumped out for me was that you kept cooking up new characters instead of bringing back someone we met a hundred right. pages ago. Right. And right. you you know, why couldn't the person who did that thing be that guy from the right. coffee shop in chapter two? You know, right. and, and just, you know, it, keep it keep it all closer to home. You don't need a cast of thousands. And That's right. it, it, that was, it was interesting thing. to me that, that you kept, um, and I, you're probably a much more developed writer even now than you were then, but that your impulse was to, you know, I need a person to do this thing, so I'm going to dream up a person, rather than right. to think, okay, well, who's available, you know, who could also do this? Right, <laughs> right. I want you to talk about, from your last comment, about how you became a writer, because you were pretty much self-taught. Did you yes. always know this was what you wanted to do, and how did you teach yourself? Was it from reading? Was it from reading? Trying? Reading. Reading, yeah. I, I have not taken writing classes. 
I, I belonged to a writing group briefly and it was cool because it made me productive, but I also have a very clear memory of um, the things I was told to cut, which became, um, they were part of the story that was my first fiction in print in the New Yorker. So, um, you know, wow. other people's reactions are interesting, but I think part of, part, one of the things you have to learn as a writer, and you know this very well, to recognize good advice wherever it may come from, and it might come from unlikely people, but also to recognize not such great advice wherever it may come from, and to not be defensive, but to really sort of, you know, understand your own work well enough so somebody's response to it might make you just feel okay and clutch it to your bosom all the tighter because you know what you're doing. That's and, right. Uh, <laughs> That's and right. <laughs> uh, people, you know, lots of people wouldn't necessarily like the shoes I'm wearing either, you know, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bet they're very chic. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but um, I think that uh, advice is, is, I mean, it's a teacher, I, I should say. One of the things I think I, I taught myself not just to write, but how to teach writing is to give the kind of advice and insight and support validation that I sure do wish I had had um you know <laughs> so. yeah yeah it's it's and that that's a great great thing and you are most certainly a brilliant editor would you like to read something what do you have in mind um I would love to have you read a little bit of Sunday Upstate I will that is a story that originally appeared in a magazine that's gone um, that was called Pages. Um, it is. That was a great magazine. I remember. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. I wrote a column for them for a while that was called Trend Spotting, where right. I would talk about whether it was cover designs that were all feet or, right. you know, that's I mean, right. I remember you know, that. Different kinds of sort of patterns where, where things, you know, were just happen waves it was, a, it was a an interesting opportunity but this is the work of fiction so how much of this do you want to hear you don't want to hear this whole oh, story that like too much. um probably like two pages okay the first two pages the first two pages okay Let's hear the first two pages sure it was after they passed the fourth gas station that alice began to hum stop humming will you lloyd hated alice's humming he knew she hummed when she had something to say but had decided not to say it Lloyd drove along the curving country road with precision and expertise, his left arm propped on the open window, his sleeves rolled up in two precise folds. He kept downshifting to third gear on the curves and then back up to fourth, and sometimes when he shifted, he kept his left arm where it was on the edge of the window, abandoning the steering wheel for brief moments. Alice stared straight ahead, searching the road for signs of impending civilization and more gas stations. The little stylized gas pump on the dashboard had been glowing urgently for almost 20 miles. More than half a gallon, she calculated. She could picture that last inch of gasoline splashing around in the tank. They had been on the outskirts of a small town when the amber light flickered on, and they had passed through the town, and now they were on a road all leafy and green in summer and probably not even zoned for gas stations. In the back seat, Joanna and Ian wrangled over a kaleidoscope. You said it would be my turn after 10 minutes. Give it. You said. You said. Didn't she, Mom? Didn't she? Please make her give it. Ian was two years younger and at 10, almost comically serious. Alice thought he was the nicest boy she had ever encountered and could hardly believe he was hers, a member of this family. She wished she knew a way to tell him he was doomed to continuous frustration in all future dealings with girls like his complicated, condescending, and devious sister. Alice turned around to adjudicate, but before she could say anything, Joanna tossed the kaleidoscope carelessly across the back seat, saying, here, have the baby toy, baby. Ian picked it up and squinted into the eyepiece, rotating in a slow circle out his window. Joanna flounced and slumped in one motion, ignoring Alice's look of disapproval. So, and, and, and on and on, um, they run out of gas. Um, so, <laughs> coast to a stop. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about, uh, you know, one thing that I noticed in all these stories is the superb first sentences where we can't 
we cannot not continue to read. This is like, you know, it was after they passed the fourth gas station that Alice began to home. It's a simple first sentence, but it's genius. Or the one about the kids going door to door, you know, trying to sell poison, not trying to sell mushrooms. Oh. How much work do you do on the first sentence? Does it just come to you or do you? I, I know that I believe very much in that the first lines of a story or a novel and the last lines mm -hmm. of a story or a novel or an essay are really critical to me. I mean, that th the language, every single word really, really matters going in and, and landing. Coming out, um, right. Yes. So um, very often I, I know the situation, but I, I really do need to think about, you know, the entry point. Um, and ideally you enter as late you can, you get in as late as you can and you get out as early as you can. <laughs> so, but those first lines, brilliantly. Those first lines matter a lot. Don't you think? Don't you work on those first lines? Constantly, <laughs> constantly. That's <laughs> pain of my writing existence. But they do, they have to be perfect. Yeah, they, it, it really, um, it opens the door. It invites the reader in. It entices the reader. It surprises the reader. It puzzles the reader. So, yeah, Absolutely. really important. One of your readers has a question. Um, Corey says, the view from the 99th floor is breathtaking. You've said tonight that it's about a couple of teenagers or youth, which may answer my question. It isn't you. Initially, I would caught the reference to the protagonist having two daughters, now twice, quote, as old as I was on that winter night and quote, we have grandchildren. I wondered if there was truth to the story or if it was a true story due to those parallels. What went into the story? Are you in there? What inspired the piece? This is a very unusual answer because I've never done anything like it before. I probably will never do anything like it again. I published an essay that was in fact memoir about this escapade. And my publisher, Paul Dry of Paul Dry Books, loved that essay so much that he asked me if I would consider trying to turn it into a work of fiction. And at first I was very resistant because I, I mean, that's not where fiction comes from. <laughs> that's not how I do this. But I took the challenge of, of turning it into a work of fiction um, and making all kinds of changes along the way. Um, and, and, you know, it is a work of fiction now, but in fact, it really does have its origins in my experience of being talked into climbing all the way up to the 99th floor of that tower under construction, open to the wind, the blue tarp flapping, a blue tarp, which by the way, also there was a blue tarp in the novella. Um, that's the sort of thing. Can you just picture those blue tarps with the grommets? You know, the people yeah. tying the boats. And, yeah. Um, so I have an experience. Um, you know, sometimes an experience is a spark for, for a piece of writing. It doesn't mean the meaning in the story is going to be the same meaning that the original experience had. Or the original experience may not have had a whole lot of meaning, but it can have altered meaning when you, you know, when you take something um, as a situation and then run with it in fiction. So, mm -hmm. so there are all kinds of shifts in tone and balance and it's, it's, it's a different piece of writing, but it's the only thing I've ever really sort of transposed into, the, into fiction from nonfiction. And do you, Catherine, and you, Caroline, do you have a particular story or stories or characters in this collection that you favor? Oh, well, the story <laughs> that I asked, all of them, I mean, the story that I asked Catherine, I loved the little kids and the mushrooms. <laughs> that really got to me. Um, I have to say, I really, I have a particular fondness for the story, A Tiny Stapler, which is um, about the woman who gets up working right. for a very difficult psychoanalyst. Um, it's, it's a short story that um, just, you know, I'm always suspicious and irritated when writers talk about 
stories that just wrote themselves, you know, the characters. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> there on the edge of the computer dictating. Yeah. But this was a story where once I once I knew what I was writing, it just flowed. It just that was where it went. Um, so and that was a story written for the um, Precious Objects pro project where random bits of junk, which is interesting because, you know, Jane of Hearts features random bits of junk, too. But um, objects were just sort of rounded up and then given to writers to write a story and then auctioned off on eBay. Um, so you, the, someone bought the tiny stapler and got a copy of my story. So the wow. question was whether the stories written about these objects enhanced their value. Um, and some of them went for, you know, for a tiny little piece of something someone picked up in Chinatown, you know, that now, you know, might have been worth 10 cents and then was worth $50. You know, it was, it yeah. was an interesting experiment. <laughs> so that was where that came from. Wow. And how did you decide what stories would go into Jane of Hearts? Well, I certainly, they're not, it's not every story I've written or every story I've published, but I, I was looking for stories that I, where I felt I had more to say, that I wanted to expand, that, that would sort of, in, in an odd way, go with the flow, even though there's such variety and it's not literally, as I say, linked stories, but, but there is connective tissue and there is a sort of ensemble cast in a certain way. So some things just really um, lent themselves to expansion. So um, the, the story that, that has the title um, Thistles was a very small story that I wrote for Red Book. Um, Dawn Raffle asked me to write a story for Red Book. Those were the days when Red Book would pay you thousands oh, yeah. of dollars for a story. Um, but it was, a, it was an embryonic version of, of the story that's in the book now. Um, it was really a, a meet cute, um, you know, jury duty, dinner with the father, but um, it, I just took it so much further. And, and I have to say, this might sound like, you know, dazzling ego. I, I'm a better writer now than I was then when that appeared. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a better writer now. So in some ways, I, I had, it was a marvelous chance to revisit stories um, that would lend themselves to expanding, revising. And in, in a certain way, if this doesn't sound too bizarre, it, it's like being able to go back into a dream, you know, a, a dream you've had to be able to re-enter the dream and keep dreaming it. Um, so, so that was a that was a big part of the process. Um, I am not comparing myself to Henry James, but I would observe that Henry James is one of many writers who um, went back to stories and revised them significantly years later. So it it's been done. <laughs> well, it does. It, it was beautifully done and bravo because we all love it, Jane of Hearts. Um, what are you both reading now? Can you tell our audience a few of your favorite current reads? Oh, my God. Well, I just oh, finished that. reading um, <laughs> Caroline's, um, you know, <laughs> book that I, that, uh, you know, I, I just found breathtaking. Um, and I know there are people who might be put off by the idea of, oh, a novel about a woman in a coma. Um, you know, that, that those people also were off by a plagiarism <laughs> with a monkey. Um, it's a miracle that Johnny Got His Gun was published by Dalton Trumbo, because that's about someone who's, you know, lying there. Um, in any case, <laughs> um, I love that book. Um, I absolutely love that book. I have just finished reading um, The Betrayal of Anne Frank, which I thought was um, really, really dark and interesting. Um, who who turned them in, um, and it, they treated it like a cold case, and they solved it. It, 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 it there is an answer. So. Fascinating. What about you, Caroline? Um, I just finished Small World by Jonathan Evison, which is amazing. It spans from the 1800s until present day. He does not stay in his lane. There's all sorts of people in this book. And he does a tremendous job like, talking about Irish people who came over, Chinese people who came over to America, the troubles they had. Um, and it's just, it's a magnificent opus. I just really, really loved it. And the other book that I was reading, was Chain of Hearts. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is this absolutely magnificent <laughs> what you're talking about. Um, it, it truly is. It truly is. It's not, it's actually a book I read twice. The first time I read for the pure enjoyment, the second time I read to see, how did you do that? Like, oh, I, I'm very flattered because I think you spend more time reading books um, and, and talking to writers and, you know, what you do um, for other writers. And I mean, you're such a marvelous citizen of um, Thank you. writers and, and, and literary fiction. Um, Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm very aware that you, um, this has now become really part of what it is you do as a writer. Yeah, uh, and and I I think you probably would agree with me that being esteemed by a by a, a fellow writer, being understood by a fellow writer, um, it's it's another league. It's not just yeah, it's everything. Know, nice people in a book group, which is great. I'll take them, you know. But um, <laughs> when I'll take them gladly and willingly. But um, when a writer you esteem esteems your work, um, it's pretty great. So I'm I'm really well, great. This is. It's a masterwork. It's just, it's truly wonderful. Truly, truly wonderful. And I think that's the perfect place for us to leave it because believe it or not, an hour has already disappeared. I can't believe it. And uh, I just really want to thank you, Catherine Weber and you, Caroline Levitt, for being with us okay. tonight. It's an honor to be able to host you. Um, hopefully in store, in person next time. Oh, yes. <laughs> But congratulations again, Catherine. Jane of Hearts, a stunning, stunning piece. All, if you've not gotten your copy yet, go get it. Come to us in store, jump online. Um, there are signed copies. Thank you, Catherine. Available at our Madison, Connecticut, RJ Julio location. When I popped in there, you were jumping. The, the, the store was thronged with people. It was thrilling. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So happy to have, we have such a great, great, local um customer base and we're so mm -hmm. grateful to all of our all of our audience members and thank you for always supporting your local independent bookstores it truly means the world to us um Absolutely. no it looked like people were christmas shopping. Yeah. It was unbelievable it was really wonderful. great <laughs> it was really feeling thrilling. comes over you when you're in the store and it's not it's not virtual shopping anymore you can actually oh, touch it's and great. Feel, especially with books you have to touch the books. I know. Um, but thank you both. And thank you, Dana. You thank have you, a wonderful Dana. Catherine. Evening.